Hi folks, here are 10 awesome things that I've learned recently about Fusion 360. Number one, notice this hole has really three different holes to it. It's got the chamfer, this bore, and then the counter bore. One of the things that's always bothered me is when I do a drill, and let's just say I wanted to poke a uh, 228 drill through that whole hole. Well, if I pick this hole, it does the height as hole top and hole bottom, which means it's only running that drill through the section that I clicked. And I just never noticed this, but there's this thing called auto merge hole segments. And if you click it, it recognizes what you're trying to do and it pokes it all the way through. I learned about this in Tim Paul's recent HSM tips and tricks video, which I thought was great. Uh, I thought though that you could also do it if you picked the chamfer and it doesn't look like it works with that, which is kind of a bummer, but still a helpful thing, good to know. Number two, cloud libraries. They're finally working pretty well. Go to your name, preferences, cam, enable cloud libraries. Now here's the trick, you need to have this checked on every computer that you use Fusion 360 for. What this does is if you expand your, uh, show your data panel, scroll all the way down, Right above samples, there's this new thing called libraries. This is your cloud assets. So in it, I've got three things. I love all of them. I've got all of my tool libraries now. They're not local to each computer. I've got my templates. And if you don't know what templates are, click card here. Templates are amazing. For us, we have preset tool operations for Delrin, for Aluminum, for Softjaws, for our Tormox, for our Haas. Phenomenal. Those are now in the cloud, so I can have them with me wherever I go. And... Lastly, your post processors. Such a nice change to have. I'm really glad to see that's working. Highly encourage you to use it. Speaking of cloud, we do do a lot of work uh, on the road. I'll do work on my laptop, waiting for somewhere uh, at home. And one of the things I've started doing is adding setup manual NC as just a way to make comments to myself. So for this one, I was making a comment to hold the part with 1.25 inch parallels, because look, I forget, I got a ton going on. It's nice to know when I set this job back up to know, hey, well, I know what the stock size is, because that was defined in the setup, but how was I holding that? Uh, the other thing I had was, I was working on this part at night and at home, and I thought, let me check tomorrow morning if I've got two inch stock on the rack. And rather than email myself, I just put a note right there because it's right where I want it to be when I poke through this file in the morning. You can add stops and this will actually stop the code from running. You'd have to hit cycle start again, which can force you uh, to read the comments. Also super helpful, we've been adding torque specs for, for fasteners and vice screws when we do certain work. And that just gives you the forces you do to do that sanity check. Love it. When you're doing simulations, number four, if I show all toolpath, you know, that's great. That gives me everything in the whole part. Let's focus down on just this adaptive and we'll click simulate. Now I'm only seeing the toolpath from this adaptive, but let's say I want to look more closely at what's happening at certain points. Speaking of that, show points. Jeff JJ mentioned this in his HSM video on getting really good 3D surface finishes and I had never noticed it either. It's awesome. Click on it you now get black points at every, every line of G-code is the best way I can explain it. So now what I could do is I can click on a point because notice you can't click on the midpoint or a mid area of a line, but points you can. It's gonna move the tool to that location. So that was number four. Number five is now what I could do, let's make that tool transparent. And instead of clicking play, or instead of scrubbing down here along the uh, green, which is what I used to do, anywhere here in the middle of your screen, I guess not on a point, but somewhere up here, uh, you know, we'll turn points off. It'll be easier to see now. I'm gonna left click and I can drag. Look at that. So now I can reorient, I can oops, double click the middle mouse wheel to get my, no, that's a good trick. Double click your middle mouse wheel to reorient to a zoom to fit. I can zoom in. And I can look, you know, how exactly is that tool linking in and leading in? I can even do it with stock. Doesn't make sense here. Oh, it's got a, it's got a preview up to that spot. Here we go. So I can see, zoom in, how that bull nose is going to engage with that part, just like so. The other cool thing, little bonus tip, is see all these points. Those points tie back to smoothing. Now I was wrong. 
I used to describe smoothing as a way to reduce the length of your code, which can be really helpful for older controllers that aren't able to digest you know, larger code, even half a meg or one megabyte long G code. That is true, but there's another reason for smoothing, and it's something that we've gotten into with our Haas lately, where if you're moving really fast, you need the machine to make smoother motion links. So let's take a look, if we can, and compare these two toolpaths. So take a look at the point density here. I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 points between those two yellow lines, just a random example. Let's change our smoothing to, let's turn it on, and then let's increase it from 1 10 thousandth of an inch to say half a thou. We're, we're roughing here. We're leaving 10 thou radial stock, so this is fine. It's not going to gouge our part. Click OK. Go back in. <laughs> Look, I, I, I gone. There's one move. How cool is that? That gives you an understanding of what smoothing is, and that can be really important for faster, uh, faster machine moves with adaptive, and it can be super important when you're doing the surfacing to get good uh, surface finishes. Speaking of surfacing, let's say I wanted to do a scallop, and I just wanted to clean up this corner right here. Let's duplicate this. This is from the Rob Lockwood uh, cam off that we did together that I knew I was going to lose before we even started. So under geometry, let's say I wanted to pick just this corner. Well, it's annoying because I can pick this full chain, and you can do it the old way, which is to click on it, click, let up, change it to open contour, and then kind of reselect, and then click the plus. It's honestly not that bad. It's just so many clicks. Other way, that's a trick today, Alt key. Hold down Alt, one, or oh, you gotta be kidding me, come on. It's supposed to work here. Huh, why doesn't it work? Well, sorry folks, that didn't go as planned. It does work with contour and other operations where, again, if I just hovered over it, it's gonna pick this whole chain. But if you hold down the Alt key, it'll just select individual change, which is really nice. Why doesn't it work on scallop, though? That's super frustrating. I never had seen an instance where it didn't work before. Um, another trick, though, would be if you change what you're starting your selection with. So, for instance, I just wanted to pick this corner. Take a look. If I happen to pick this left edge, it picks what I want from the start and avoids you having to go through that process. Two really good tips on looking at your model, how to orient it. I'm back in the model. Let's say I want to look at this fillet. I want to look at it, what's called, I think, normal two, which means I basically want to have the model positioned so that I'm straight down at the, uh, what would this be called, the perpendicular to the tangency or something. I don't know these fancy words, but if I click on it, I can now click the square box with the little sawtooth here that says look at, click at it once, and that, I believe, actually, you know what, that looks like it's steeper. What well, presents you normal to it, uh, I thought. You know, obviously this is easy because we can just click the back. Same thing here. You could click this and normal to it'll move you or look at it, it'll move you to the side. The other thing you can do, which I like, is let's say I want to rotate this. Well, if I start rotating it like this way, I lose my being normal to, and if I click right again, it straightens me out. Click on the free orbit or orbit. I didn't notice this until recently. There is a very faint gray circle around it. And when your mouse is hovered over that area, click on it with the left mouse hold, I can now rotate this like so and not lose my staying normal to this surface. Super helpful. Tip number nine is actually, I'm gonna say, uh, go watch this video, link in the video description or card here, that Seth Medor did from Liberty Machine on some really good tips and tricks. And the one that I liked was using the patch environment to control your toolpath containment. And a couple examples were, the one if I can zoom forward here, you should really watch this whole video, but he showed a surface where he didn't want the toolpath to dip down into these holes, super common problem. And rather than defeature it, you can use the patch environment to super quickly cover that up. In fact, let me see if I can show you. So you go to model, patch, and let's say we didn't, when we were surfacing this and we didn't want the tool to dive down in here and we didn't want to have to pick 
that as like an exclusion zone. We just wanted to change the model, which it totally seems like it can be the easier way. I'll do create and I'll pick, I've never done this before, I'll click this. That looks good. Click OK. Is it that really that easy? Um, I've never done this before. W w by all means, watch Seth's video. I'm just learning myself here. But that now gives you the ability to select this face, which is not going to allow your, you know, you've seen that where the ball end mill dives down into the hole and you don't want it to. Awesome. Seth had also shown something that I can't figure out, which was the shift key key to show formulas. And this worked in HSM works back in the day for me. Uh, and in, so if I go to say a drill cycle, the pecking depth, that's not a random dimension of 0.125. If I right click and do edit expression, you can see it's the tool diameter times 0.25. So that's super helpful. And you can change that. Let's say we only wanted to peck at one uh, eighth of an inch of, or one eighth of the tool diameter. You could change it and you could even set that as your default with make all default for everything that John or you do. But there's a way to hold the shift key and have not only the formula pop up, but some really other helpful information about what that field or variable is called. And this is super useful because some of these formulas are more complicated in terms of referencing if statements and min maxes and so forth. Yeah, if we look at a 2D adaptive linking, the minimum stay down clearance, right click, edit expression. Yeah, that's a pretty, not complicated, but there's a math of the max of the min of the tool diameter with some other variables. Sometimes you need to know what these are called and what they're referenced so that you can use them to build custom formulas. Very helpful. And the shift key is supposed to work. Somebody know why, why it doesn't work for me? Uh, and then the last thing, tip number 11, I think, actually, is splines. So we did a Fusion Friday on making a spline to, uh, this is not a part, this is just a, a screenshot. And we were incorrect in that we made way too many spline points because I thought it made it easier to do. But that's not good for a spline workflow because you want fewer spline points for, a, I guess, a more organic or flowing shape. So check it out. It's so amazing. You don't need as many spline points as I thought. I was, again, trying to click a bunch to have the spline naturally hug the part. Instead, just try clicking kind of where the part changes direction. So there it changes, maybe there, you know, maybe there, uh, maybe there. This has got a little bit of a, a hug in it there. Finish the spline. So this does not hug the part, uh, agreed, but take a look. Click on the points and you can use the bars to start dragging the location of them and how they interact. Now this is a iterative because the each uh, spline point or node plays off of the previous one, but you can drag the location of the bar and the length of it or the location of your point rather, the length of the bar, the direction of the bar. And I'll tell you, it's pretty fun. You can start to figure out how to get that shape to work. And I'm again told that from a design standpoint and from a machining standpoint, you're gonna get a much more organic flowing spline shape uh, doing it this way. So pretty fun. Again, the takeaway is fewer spline points. You can always add more and spend more time getting them to form with just a little bit of massage like so. Pretty cool stuff. So folks, hope you enjoyed. Hope you learned something. Take care. See you next Friday. Mm -hmm.